I just want to welcome all of you to Stonyport Community Church. We're so glad all of you guys are here this morning. We just want to welcome all of you if you didn't get a chance to do that personally. Just I'm so thankful for each and every one of you guys. So moved uh, on your behalf. And it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. I, I always remember, uh, quick little story, it's kind of a side note, but I always remember uh, getting up early because we had to, and when I lived in Russia, we had to, it was like a two hour, an hour bus ride, train ride, so on and so forth to get to church. And uh, so we were up really early in the morning to try to get there to church on time. And I remember this one guy was always down there, just, you know, was like, it wasn't even light yet. And he's sitting down there waiting for the, the bus to come. And one of the other believers that, that lived in the, the, the compound that we lived in, he'd always just be like, it's, you know, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And he just said it with a booming voice. You know, we're just kind of like half asleep sitting there waiting. And uh, I just remember like, oh, why is he so enthusiastic? <laughs> but uh, it is good. It is truly good. It's such a meaning, that is such a meaningful statement. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord, to be with God's people, to feel the love that you guys have for each other, for us, that we have for you guys. That's what this is about. That's what Second Timothy is about. It's about sharing love. It's about it's about you can feel the heart of a pastor here. You can feel the heart of Paul leading to want to be uh, several times. I, I don't remember exactly the exact number, how many times he says, I long to be with you. I long to see you face to face. But it's a number of times he mentions that through this really short letter, only four chapters here, uh, that he goes through. And it's, in fact, it's so personal that some people said, this couldn't be written by Paul because it's too personal. I, I think that's kind of ridiculous because how, why would Paul not be uh, personal? Absolutely would be personal, especially when writing to probably one of the most important people in his life. Paul probably was never married, uh, but he discipled a lot of young men into the pastorate, and one of those was Timothy. And he probably got closest to Timothy. This was a relationship not unlike uh, uh, Pastor Stephen Orman down in Southern California. I got to go down there to a shepherd's conference with him just recently. And uh, he's the one that trained me, did a lot of that nuts and bolts training. And it took, it was a several year process. Uh, it was a couple of years that we did where I was just running the youth ministry and I would meet with him on a regular basis. A little bit less formal, and then it became much more formal later on over a year and a half of very intensive training. But you build a bond in that kind of relationship, a, a father to son spiritual relationship where one person has invested into the other, the other person has received that investment and is passing that on to other people. Yeah, so some your microphone is cutting out. Is it cutting out? Yeah, you better use the... Time for a quick battery change. You want to switch it off? Bring it up to me when you guys Okay. Guys, what, what do you need to keep, can I keep going or? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, we're going to keep going. So a father to son relationship that's going on here, and that's what's being uh, celebrated in this passage. But if you remember, the context is difficult. As personal as this letter is, as touching as it is, the context is very difficult. What's going on in the world around them is very challenging. One of the fiercest persecutions almost in Christian history is about to take place as the entire power of the Roman Empire comes down on Christianity and, and begins to persecute Christianity across the scope of that empire, which is an amazing thing to think about. And it would be a terrifying thing for them to think about as they realize that their churches could be burned, that their people could be imprisoned, and they could even be killed for just expressing their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a very serious thing. But yet, so much love and tenderness is communicated in this letter. And Paul gives two things, and that's what we want to focus on here in this passage, two things to equip Timothy for that. Uh, the first thing is cling to good teaching. The second thing is surround yourself with faithful believers. And I think the principles here, and this is why this passage, why this book has been preserved by the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's really written by the Holy Spirit, Paul transcribing it down. This is why this book has been preserved. Not all of Paul's letters were preserved. Not all of them were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but this one was. 
Perfect. We good? Sweet. Sorry. Sorry for the. Is that better? No. It's been not working. I mean, come on. It's not working. Not working? Yep. Did you die? Yeah. No, we're not getting anything here. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So that's what this is. This is why it's been preserved. It's been preserved because the principles that Paul is giving to Timothy to go through the difficult time that he's going through, to go through the suffering, to go through the, uh, the anxiety, to go through the fear, to go through the depression, all the things that would come with this very difficult moment in Timothy's life, Paul gives him principles to be able to face these things. Teachings that he can cling to, teachings that he can remember as he goes through difficult times. And more importantly, lead the believers that he's going to be leading throughout his church. You know, Timothy's not just a man responsible just for himself. He's responsible for probably by this point a rather large body of Christ. His church could have easily numbered several hundred people or maybe many, many more. Oops, there's working out. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's what Paul is giving it. And these two principles, I believe, as, as you're going to see in the text here, clearly can speak to you today. The first one is cling to good teaching. The other one is surround yourself whoops, with true believers. All right, we'll get this figured out here eventually. Paul oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Try that. There we go. There we go. That better? Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. It's like that old Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, well, it's good to, good to be back with you. Good to be back on the herd. So here we are, like just what I was saying here. Two points this morning. Cling to good teaching. Surround yourself with uh, believers, with, with people who are faithful in Jesus Christ. You know what the fact is, the reality is, is when we go through hard times, what are the first two things that we often give up? Good teaching. And surrounding ourselves with faithful believers. We often want to get alone, away from it all. And those are the last things that we need to be doing. Paul knows that if Timothy stays healthy in his walk in faith in Jesus Christ, he's going to build a healthy church, and that church will be able to sustain and continue on in the midst of very, very difficult times. So let's go through this. What are the two things that Paul wants to really emphasize? This is the final part of chapter 1 here. You'll see that we're going to be going through the last part of the chapter. This is kind of his opening statement. And then verse 1 of chapter 2 is going to start off with, Thou therefore. And you should always ask yourself when reading the Bible, what is the therefore, therefore, right? Well, in other words, the rest of the chapter 2 is going to be contingent upon what he said in his opening statements in chapter 1. There's a reason why they put the chapter right there, because they want to emphasize the point that this, what's coming following is based upon what he said in the beginning. And these two principles that he leaves Timothy with here in his opening statements are universal. They go for all of us. They're for every single one of us. They're, they, I put that on the Facebook page if you saw that. that what are the two things you need to know to get, to get you through hard times? That's what this is. The first one is hold fast or cling to good teaching. Hold fast to the form of sound words. That's the opening statement there of verse 13. Hold fast. Now, <clears throat> we don't necessarily use that phrase too much anymore, the word hold fast. But to me, there's a lot of meaning to it. L let me explain it. Let me give you a picture, and then I think you'll get the sense of what I'm talking about. What does, what, why it's translated that way, hold fast. Uh, there's a movie, uh, somebody who's seen Master and Commander, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but it's a pretty good historical movie. But there's, there's an older guy on this, this ship as they're sailing through the ocean. They're fighting with different enemy ships. It's on back in the 1700s. And one day this huge storm comes, violent, violent storm. And they, they're fighting this storm. They're trying to keep the ship from sinking. You know, the, the, the older sailors are doing everything they can. The leadership of the ship is trying to keep this, this ship afloat. And uh, this older guy who, who had been injured in one of the previous battles in the movie or the story, and uh, he can't really speak very well, but he has tattooed on his hand each letter of, of, on, his, of, on a finger, hold fast. And the younger guys are getting kind of scared as the storm gets worse and worse. And so this older guy will continually put his fists together and says on there, hold fast. What does that mean at that time? It meant then. It still really should mean the same thing. 
Hold fast is to cling firmly. We think of fast as going, going somewhere fast and moving quickly. But fast also can mean secure. Like to make something fast, to, to, to secure it down. Stay strong. Uh, cling to it firmly and remain strong. Cling to the, to cling to the ship. You know, the temptation of that moment would be, hey, let's jump, let's start to get in the water, but you're going to die. There's no hope. Your hope is that ship. If you don't keep that ship secure, if you don't stay on top of it, you're gonna, we're all going to go down together. It'll all be in trouble together. And I think that there's so much to that. I, think, I really appreciate the way it was translated this way. While it may sound a little bit unfamiliar to modern ears, it really has a deep sense of the meaning of what is going on here in Greek. Because the Greek here, and I put that in your notes, uh, the, the Greek here is, it could be more translated as, is, is cling to the pure teachings of the Logos so that we can imitate Him on this earth. That's really what's, what's going on here. And some of the new translations just kind of, kind of do a simplified version of that. But I think that you can really think about this. The, the Greek word there, like I said, for hold fast, is to cling firmly, to, to make secure, to cling to. The word form there is, is exactly like we would think about it in Greek. It's morphe, which is the form or the idea or the image of something. And the word sound words is simply the word logos. Where do we get that, right? You should know what that Greek word means. If you've ever seen a logo, that's the meaning. It's the face of it's the idea of, it's the center teaching of something. And we know that, and it's translated often in most English versions today as the Word, right? Capital W Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was what? Was God. Right? That's what he's talking about. Cling to the Logos. Cling to the image of the Logos. But he doesn't mean this, and that's where I think some of the modern translations somewhat err in the sense of just simply translating it the way it is in Greek. It doesn't mean this in the sense of some kind of mystical sense, like, and like some people actually believe. They actually draw a picture of Jesus Christ, and, and they just focus on that image, and they believe that through that image they can somehow connect to the actual person of Jesus Christ through that picture. That, that's pretty hocus pocus, right? I mean... That's not really great. It's good to have a picture of Jesus, maybe a representation of who it is. Maybe we can even think about what he looks like. And the Bible never describes it, but he does say that he was not a person of you know comely, comeliness. He wasn't particularly beautiful. But it's okay to meditate on what Christ looked like, but there's something much, much more important going on here. We do have a direct connection to Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible uses the word word to talk about the word, the capital W word, Jesus Christ. It wants us to make in our minds synonymous, the way to find Christ is right here. It's a book. If it was a painting, think about how exclusive a painting would be, right? I mean, think about it. If it was just simply some kind of good painting of Jesus Christ, that was the way to connect to Christ. What about all the people who couldn't come see the painting? Did they not get to get see the name of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. That would not be true. It has to be a book that is made available to all men in all languages all over the world. And that is the Logos. That is why the Bible continually translates the word, word, and the word for Jesus Christ. The same thing. It's the same thing. Because who is Jesus? Think about it in a more deeper philosophical sense. Who is the Logos? The word of God. The written grafe as, as, as scriptural as the Bible sometimes put it. The written word of God. It's to project meaning through a teaching, right? That's what Logos is. It's a teaching. It's an ideology. It's a way of looking at the world. See, somebody said uh, very clearly, I think it's Robbie Zacharias, a great, great teacher. We, we do not believe, uh, in, in, we believe in the equality of individuals, but we do not believe in the equality of ideas. We do not. Because there are some teachings, there are some ideas that are very, very destructive. I was reading recently from somebody there said, you know, why are some of these high school shootings going on? Well, everybody's wondering why. Why would this happen, right? Well, we don't really have to ask why. We can go and look what those kids wrote. They wrote the reasons why they did it. You know, the two that did the Columbine shooting, they wrote extensively about why they did what they did. So they wrote long journals. One of them said, one of them believed very firmly that Hitler was not enough. He should have what, not just wiped out the Jews. He should have wiped out the entirety of the human race. He believed that all humans were evil. Therefore, it was his purpose on earth to kill as many of them as possibly can. And himself. 
That is not a healthy idea. That is not a good teaching. That is a very disturbing, wicked teaching that led a young man to not only destroy his life, but the lives of many people in his school. We, do, we believe in the equality of the individual, but we do not believe in the equality of ideas or teachings. There is one teaching that is above all that. What is that? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to me, but, but cometh to the Father, but by me. He does not mean a picture of him or his physical body or some kind of mystical sense. What he means is his teachings, his way of looking at the world. He wants to survive. He says, go study the Sermon on the Mount. Go study his teachings. That's where Christ is. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy to do. He says, don't be distracted by all the other pictures and all the other teachings and all the other crazy ideas that everyone else is coming up with in this world today. Focus on the teachings of Jesus Christ. That is what is preserved for you right here. I hope you have a copy of the Bible. If you don't, I want to change that today. We'll get you one. Don't leave here without it. This is your tie to Jesus Christ. Learn his teachings. Jesus says, if you want my yoke, take care of my yoke upon you. If you learn of me, and I will make it your life easy. The teachings of Jesus Christ and there in Matthew 11 is what the point of that passage is. That's what the yoke that we accept upon ourselves, this burden that we accept upon him, his teachings, that his doctrines, the doctrines of Jesus Christ. One person can put it this way, the, the doctrines of grace itself. That's what the word of God gives us. He says, cling to that. Hold fast to that if you want to use the more archaic term, if you will. Well, cling to it if you want to use the new. Uh, don't let it go. Cling to good teachings. Boy, we need, there's nothing more in a world where, like I said, I gave you an example of what young people are coming to believe in our world today, and they're actually going out and acting on the teachings that they have come to believe. Surprise, surprise, right? Why do people misbehave? It's because they have filled their minds with ideas that are lies and are untrue. Cling to the truth of God's word. Cling to the form of sound words. Meditate on them, right? Look at the Psalm 1. We just went through Psalms over and over and over again. It says, meditate on the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Lift up the word of God. Think about the word of God. Make the word of God a part of your life. Continually, David reminds us over and over again. He says, hey, there in Psalm 1, he says, if you want to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that is successful and prosper, to meditate on God's word. He said, if you want to be like the world that's eventually going to be blown away to destruction and like the chaff that's blown by the wind, then go meditate on some, something else and see how it destroys your life. Paul says, to, advises Timothy to hold fast to the pure teachings of the Logos so that we can imitate him on this earth. Nothing changes this way. When we study Christ's teachings, we realize what that should, that should be in my life. And the Holy Spirit takes over and enables us to be able to live that here on this earth. As we focus not on an image of him, but on his teaching, sound words, the, the logos, his teaching, then we will gain a pure heart of faith. And a pure heart of faith will only be found in the teachings of Jesus. We, and I put this here notes, you can follow along right there in front of you. We love the word, capital word, for the word, uh, we love the word of the word, for the word, for in the word we find the perfect portrait of the word. You see that? Look at that in your notes. We love the word of the word, for in the word we find the perfect portrait of the word. Let's look at 1 Peter. Peter says it very well. I can never explain it as well as he does. 1 Peter 1, 18 says, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed of corruptible things. If you were redeemed of corruptible things, you'd be dead. It would, it, there would be no hope for eternal life as silver and gold. Because even silver and gold eventually corrupt and decay. Even though they last for thousands and thousands of years, they eventually break down. From your life, from your, from your vain conversation received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb. See, that's what they had. This was their God right here. I want to go back actually here. The vain conversation, lifestyle received by the tradition of the empty lives that they received from the tradition of their fathers. They had what was called the mission, and Jesus condemns that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 15, which was a tradition, oral tradition by the time of Jesus. It's now written down. But that was what they worshipped. They thought, oh, these, these, these teachings of 
all these great men who we respect. Not that they were bad. They may have been very well intentioned. But the teachings of men break down at some point. We don't we guide our lives by them. We guide them by the word of Jesus Christ. The Bible. But with the precious blood of the Lamb of Christ, of the Lamb without spot and blemish without spot. That's what Christ's blood did for us. It cleansed us. Who barely for a day before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have four Gospels detailing the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be talking about and celebrating. That's what this is. Palm Sunday, this morning, is a celebration this week of what Christ did, which was four days before the foundation of the world for you. Who, by him, do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Right? I'm not clinging to a little image or a picture of Jesus Christ or maybe a piece of his hair or a piece of the cross or a piece of something else or some other picture of him. You know, I, you know, I, I like to, to study about that, uh, what, what's the, the, the one image of Jesus Christ. It's on the, I can't remember how that, uh, maybe some of you can help me out later, but uh, might be true, might not be, I don't know, but I don't worship that. I worship Christ. He's a spirit of evil alive. God has raised him up from the dead. He believes he lives in my heart. I hope he lives in yours this morning. Seeing you have purified your souls, obeying the truth through the love of the, through the Spirit. What is the truth? The logos. Remember what I said earlier? We love the word, little word, of the big word. For in the little word, we find the perfect portrait of the big word. That's where we find it. He continues to explain it. A divine faith love. That's where pure love comes. Not fake love. There's a lot of fake love out there. A lot of people will tell you that they love you, but they don't really. They want to take advantage of you. But Jesus Christ is not that way. The unfading love of a brother and seeing that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. How do we have love in our church? Through Christ. Through his teachings. By him teaching us, hey, don't, don't let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, to put others first. To lay your life down for other people. And be born again, not corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, preserved for you, hopefully this morning, in your hands, in front of you, in this book, preserved by God's grace for you to read in its purity today. So just in case you're doubting the word that you have in front of you is true, let's go to the scriptures to find evidence that it is true. For in all flesh is as grass, and the glory of the man is a flower of the grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of God endureth forever. How long? Forever. So how do I know? There's going to be, there has been, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to come up with attacks against God's word and say, oh, it's not true, it's not, it's not been preserved, it's been corrupted, it's been changed, it's been redacted, it's been edited, blah, 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 blah. No, I believe in the Bible it says, the Word of God endures. Actually, that's not just written there in Peter. He's quoting from the Old Testament in Isaiah. The Word of God endureth forever, and this is the Word which the Gospel is preached unto you. Have you ever read the Gospels? That's the same one he's talking about. You can stand in faith. Cling to good teaching. Cling to good teaching. A couple of things that he lists underneath this, this sub point. A couple of sub points here. Number one, A, is hold fast to the pure teaching of the Logos, which is essentially the same as the first one. The second one, B, you'll see it there in your notes. Test everything by the Apostles' Doctrine, which is preserved for you in the New Testament, which thou hast heard of me. That's his next phrase. Now, I hope to God you don't test everything by what I said. Because <laughs> I'm not perfect. And that's not what Paul is saying. But what Paul is saying here is that God is going to use me to write the scriptures. That's what he's saying. He's re-underscoring the fact that the Holy Spirit worked through him to write the pure word of God so that we be therefore preserved for you to read today. That's why he says, which thou hast heard of me. The sound words which thou hast heard of me. He's not actually even saying that everything he said was pure and accurate because it wasn't. What he's saying is that what I wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can cling to because it is the pure word of God and by it you can test it the doctrines of any age and the teachings of any time. They're universal. And they stand the test of time. Why do I always compare scriptures? Why do we always do all this cross-reference thing? I'm looking at one verse here, and then I go back to the Old Testament and look at another. Because I want to show you the harmony of it. 
If Paul was writing this of his own opinion, there would be no harmony. There would be no, they, they would fall apart at some point. But over and over again, I can demonstrate to you one time after another, after another, after another, that what Paul is writing here in the Old Testament or the Old Holy Spirit is perfectly aligned with what is written in the Old Testament. They are one and the same. He says, hold fast to Scripture, which thou hast heard of me, the words of God, which I have written down, which have been written down before in the Old Testament. Cling to those teachings. Listen to those. Are my teachings perfect? No. I teach this, the Word of God, the Bible. If it doesn't line up with that, I hope you'll come up with correction. But I'm not perfect. I don't have, I'm not writing at the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I'm just trying to understand this as best as I can with the help of God's, God's Holy Spirit. Two things here. <clears throat> Test everything by the Apostle Doctrine. One, one verse I want to mention here before we move on. I'm sorry. Uh, Acts 2 42, and they continue steadfastly in the Apostle's Doctrine. Again, what is that? That's the New Testament that you have in front of you and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. That's what the church is. Second, third point there, number C, we cling to the word, the logos, and this produces two great things in us. As we hold fast to the form of sound words, as we cling to the logos, to the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to the, the apostles' doctrine, which is the New Testament preserved for you in front of you and the Bible this morning, something happens. Something happens. It produces two things in you. And that's what he lists off here. He says, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Like, wait a minute. No, no, no. That's what Jesus said. It comes from the Bible. Remember what we said earlier? Go back to the beginning of, of what he said earlier. We love the Word. But we love the Word of the Word. For in the Word we find the perfect portrait of the Word. Why is it the same Word? All its logos throughout the New Testament for the Bible and for Jesus Christ. Because God wants us to think of those things as the same. That's where we find Christ. That's where we find His love, unadulterated, reserved for you. There's some of the things that I'm going to say that's wrong? Absolutely. If another pastor comes here someday, someday is he going to make some mistakes? Yeah. I've had some of the pastors in the past who have preached here in the past, have they made some mistakes? Yes. They all do. But this has no mistake. This is the pure Word of God, preserved for you, in which you can find the true love of Jesus Christ, and you can cling to it, and as you do, it produces, through the work of Christ, in His Word, in your heart, it produces two things. Faith and love. Let's look at the first one here. first one is faith. What is that? Well, let's look at first the second Thessalonians chapter 13 for clarification. And we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Are you beloved of the Lord this morning? You might not think so. But if Christ is working in your heart this morning, you have the Holy Spirit, if you're trusting in Him for your salvation, then you are. Were they perfect? No. <laughs> but He's still saying that about them. You are beloved of the Lord because God had checked from the beginning, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Why were you chosen? It says it right there. Because you believed in the truth. You believe God's word to be true. Do you believe this morning that God's word to be true? Raise your hand. Anyone here this morning? I believe God's word to be true. Okay. Then this could be described of you. If you truly, if you're just raising your hand, it's God. I'll let it blend in. It's not. But if you truly believe what you, what you said you believe, but believe in the word of God, the spirit of truth, which is in the word of God, then you have been chosen from the beginning for salvation, for sanctification. And you are beloved of the Lord. Whereunto is called unto you by glory to obtain the glory of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. Faith is a belief in God's word, a belief that, that you're going to believe what is true, that God loves you, that he gave his son for you. Let's look at the most simplest verse in the Bible, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that verse to be true? Amen. You're saved. You have a trust in Jesus Christ. Now, if you're just faking it or whatever, then yeah, then no, it's not. But true love, remember, unfeigned love comes from the Word of God. And you believe the Word of God, you believe the truth that God has chosen you from the beginning. He's going to work in your life. And ultimately, He's going to give you the glory that, he, that is obtained by Jesus Christ. Whereunto He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what faith is. 
I believe the truth of God's Word, God's Holy Spirit through His work in the Word, uh, cleanses me through the blood of Jesus Christ and gives me faith in the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what we have. When we love the Word and we love the capital W Word, Jesus Christ, His salvation for us, then we receive faith. But we receive one more thing. What is that? Love. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. It says, the, the great love chapter. It says, now, for now we see through a glass darkly. We don't understand everything about love, right? You know, there's some days when I'm not very loving. You could probably go ask somebody who knows me really well and say, is Kevin always loving? No, probably not. I don't always understand love perfectly. If we're honest, we maybe don't even understand love very well, right? I mean, maybe you've lived with people who did not show very much love. Maybe your parents never showed you very much love. We don't understand very well here on this side of glory, here on this side of death, but then face to face. What is he saying? He says, someday I'm going to stand before love itself. What does it say? The Bible, the Bible say who God is? God is love. You're going to stand face to face with love itself. You won't need faith anymore because you have love. You, you understand the fullness of it. Faith is a hope of things we cannot see, right? As it says in Hebrews. Faith is a belief that there is true love. Faith is a belief that there is true purpose. Faith is a belief that Jesus Christ did come and die on the cross for my sins and paid my penalty for me and gave me eternal life. That's what faith is. But someday when we stand face to face with Christ in glory, faith will not be needed anymore. And that's what he said here in this chapter. He says, hey, you know what? Faith is awesome. But faith is not necessarily necessary once we get to heaven because you'll see that face to face. You'll understand what love is. And now I know a part. To sit here on this earth, I don't know a part. I trust in the Word of God that the Word of God is true, that what it's telling me about the love of Jesus and the love of God is true, and I believe that. It's, but it's only a part of what love is. But someday they'll know, even as I am known, they don't know face to face. Now by the faith, hope, charity. Remember, what does it start with? Faith. You've got to believe the Bible is true. You've got to believe that what God says about the fact that for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, you've got to believe that that's true. It's hard to believe that sometimes, but it is true. Out of faith produces hope. But finally, it comes to the understanding of love. Now, if you've been in faith for a long time, I hope you have an understanding of love. And how do I know if you have an understanding of love? We can see it, right? <laughs> Just ask the people around you, are you a loving person? If not, then you need to go back and do some more study on faith, more study in the Word of God, because that's where love comes from. And ultimately, when you go to heaven and be before God, that's all that will be left, and that's what he says. These three, but the greatest of these is faith. The enduring, unending thing of all the faith will come to an end. Love will not. Because faith is based upon love. Who's love? Jesus Christ, right? And that's why he lists them off here in this, in, this, in this phrase. Faith is not more important than love. Faith just comes before love. Don't you see how he got that right? Only the Holy Spirit can help Paul get that perfectly correct. He says, first faith, then love in Jesus Christ. Ultimately, not dying, not ending love in Jesus Christ. Let's go on to point number two this morning. Number two says... Surround yourself with faithful believers. Cling to the Word of God. Cling to truth. Cling, cling to the love that is portrayed to you in that truth, in the Word of God, the Logos, and Jesus Christ. Cling to Jesus Christ. But surround yourself with faithful believers. What do faithful believers look like? And that's what we want to talk about this morning. This is what Paul does. He gives an example of people who are not faithful and people who are. Let's look at this. Verses 15 through 18. It says... Thou knowest that they which are in Asia be turned away from me, among whom is, I'm going to mess this up too, Philogus and Hermogenes. I think that's sort of correct. If you're a Greek expert, correct me afterwards, that's fine. I'm not even necessarily a Greek expert. But that's not the end of it. Let's look at verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Ornisiphus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my shame. But when he was at Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me. The Lord granted to him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest well. 
This is a very, very beautiful phrase. I want to break it down for you. But first, we've got a group of people to do it. Two people. The reality is, you know what? <laughs> i got to be honest with you. When I was preparing the sermon, I was putting it together. I was going to be hard on, uh, what are their names here? Pilagists and Hermogenes. I thought, man, we're going to just pound these guys. We're going to find some other scripture passages on these guys. We're just going to declare who they are and how they messed up and blah, blah, blah. That's not what's going on here. Paul is not being hard on them. He's not. He's just saying they fell away. They left. They lost their faith. They, they walked away from God. Now, I do believe that if you're truly saved, that like it says later on in 1 John, it says they went out from us because they were not of us. I do believe that if you're truly saved, your faith will endure to the end. It will not be lost. If you're saved in Christ, then you cannot be lost. Now, were they, were they saved? Were they not? We can argue about that. I don't know, but I don't believe that they were saved. They may have looked like they were saved. They may have looked like they were good Christians. But for some reason, under the pressure of the persecution, under the difficulty of what was going on, they failed and they walked away. That's all Paul says about them. There is actually no other mention of these two individuals in the New Testament or in the Bible ever again. So whether they return to faith later on, we don't know. We just don't know. Maybe someday in heaven we'll see them. Maybe someday in heaven we won't. We don't know. Uh, all we know is that they were mentioned here that they turned away. There will be some that turn away. People who do not cling to God's word, cling to the truth of God's word, and do not surround themselves with other believers will fall away. Let me warn you this morning. Do not be a part of that group. There are always going to be a part of the elitists who think, well, I'm too good to be in the church building worshiping with so-and-so who I can't stand, and therefore I'm going to walk away from my faith because I'm angry at so-and-so. Do not be a part of that group. Don't. And the really reality of this, these words, as I study them more in Greek and look at what Paul is saying, it's really just a sad thing that Paul says. He's not condemning them. He's not accusing them. He's not, he's not angry at them. He's just sad that they miss out. And that would be true of you if you did not cling to the love of God and surround yourself with faithful believers. It says later on, Paul does condemn one but person later on in this book. It says, For Demas have forsaken me, loving this present world. There are even going to be some that leave the church, they go on because they just love the world. They do not have an eternal perspective. They do not love Jesus Christ. They love the things of this world and they leave and they depart. Now these people, of course, left Titus and them. They left because they had other duties. They did not leave the faith. But Demas did, as was mentioned here in this passage. But that's not necessarily the case with Philegius and Harmonides. We don't know what happened to them. They're never mentioned again. Possibly they never came back. We don't know. But let's look at this morning someone who did, who was faithful. That's who this is, Onesiphorus. Now he's mentioned a couple different times, and I encourage you to go look it up. Uh, he's mentioned a few different other places. But Onesiphorus was a special guy. And let's look at what's here. These are the type of people you want to surround yourself with. Now, Onesiphorus is not alive today. <laughs> I know that sounds very simplistic. But he's not here, right? But I do believe there are plenty of men and women of faith who are just like him in this community that you can surround yourself with. Choose these kind of friends. And let's go through this list. Paul mentions a bunch of specific things about our Onesiphorus here, but each of them I think could apply directly to someone you might know this morning. Let's look at it. six marks of a man. I mean that in a general sense. This can be a man or a woman, uh, anyone of faith. Six marks of a man of God are, the first one is he is reliant upon the mercy of God. Let's look at that. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. How would Onesiphorus would have received that comment? He would have said, thank you, Jesus, I have mercy. You know, I don't necessarily know, we don't know too much about Onesiphorus, but he was a man who loved the blessing and the mercy of Christ. He was a man whose faith was in Christ. He was a man whose life was motivated by Christ and the love that Christ lived with. And you can see that by the rest of this list. I mean, this guy is a very noble person. He's a man of God who's, who's, who's sacrificed of his own self. In contrast to the previous two mentioned people who did not endure, who did not stay with the faith over the long haul, but left, he stuck with it. And his persistence and endurance and courage and commitment shines through, even though we have said little about him here in this passage. But let's look at that. First of all, a man of God or a woman of God is reliant upon the mercy of God. They trust in Jesus Christ. 
for their salvation. They believe that even though they do good works and they are a good person, that their good works do not save them. They need Jesus Christ just as much as you and I this morning. They're trusting in the atoning work of Christ on the cross. They're reliant upon the mercy of God. The second one this morning is that he ministers to the physical needs of others. I love this one. You see, look at this here. It says right there, and that's the next part of verse 16. It says, for he offered refreshment. This was a frequent event. You know, it's one thing to give someone a cup of cold water or to, to minister to someone's physical ailments or needs or or maybe they just needed a gift. You know, I remember uh, growing up, my dad was out of a job many, many times uh, throughout our lives, constantly looking for different jobs and things like that. We had very, very little money. And there were a number of times people in the church gave us a car. Grow. Well, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I remember thinking, like, do, do cars fall out of trees as a kid? I mean, I just say, how do, where do they come from? A lot of these people in the church that gave us these cars, they would never tell, tell us who we are. To this day, I have no idea who those people were that blessed us. They just gave out the grace of God, the love for, for God, the love for us, and gave to us to our need, that fit our need at that time. The same thing is going on here. He doesn't just do it once. You know, it's easy maybe to do a gift of love once. Maybe you gave a generous donation at one point uh, to a church, to a friend, to a loved one, or maybe to just a fellow believer who was suffering in Christ. And now you just live the rest of your life boasting about that one time you gave a generous do jo donation. Hey, I'm glad you gave the generous donation. I thank God that you did that. That's a great thing. But what did Onesiphorus do? He did it continually. He kept going back and ministering to the needs of someone. He kept doing it. He off refreshed me. He continually came back and gave. A mark, the second mark of a man of God is someone who continually, over a long course of time, goes back and ministers to the needs of others. Trust me, it's hard, right? Especially if somebody's really needy. Uh, you know, they're, they're used, sometimes, uh, maybe I won't tell that one, but uh, sometimes some people are troublesome, right? They mess up over and over and over again. you got to go pull them out of the ditch a second, third, fourth, fifth time. But isn't that what Jesus would do? And that's what Onesiphorus would have done. He goes back continually and refreshes and ministers to the physical needs of others. I love that phrase. The, second, the third thing here is that he is not ashamed of those who are suffering for Christ, but rather speaks on their behalf. Now, was Onesiphorus in prison? Nope. Could he have be, been in prison for identifying with Paul and ministering to Paul? Absolutely. Here's a man, he's free to do what he wants to do, but he goes to the center of trouble, Rome, the place where the fiercest persecution is going on, and he finds the person who's in the most danger, who's about to be executed, and that's the guy this guy wants to minister to? Wow, this guy is a man of courage. This guy is not afraid. Be that way. Be ready to stand up for those who do not speak for themselves. Be ready to go where culture, our culture would not say, oh, I don't, that's a subject taboo topic. I would never want to talk about that one. You need to be ready to stand in the gap, to be ready to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to identify with those people. I'm willing to identify with the name of Christ. I'm willing to suffer alongside them if need be. He was not ashamed of my shame. What a, what a beautiful statement that Paul says. He's not ashamed of the sufferings of the people of Christ. Yeah, if you want to lock him, you're going to have to lock, you can lock him up. You're going to have to lock me up too. And there's a story of the time where a Christian was going to be executed. And the executioner, as, a, as he's about ready to behead the, the Christian, suddenly realizes, you know what? I'm going to be a Christian too. Took off his clothes, took off his hood, got down, said, if you're going to execute him, you're going to have to execute me as well. Because I want to identify with Christ. Do not be ashamed of those that are suffering for Christ, but rather speak out on their behalf. That's the third mark of a man of God. The fourth mark of a man of God is he diligently seeks to uh, seeks for those in need in order to help them. Where do you find people in need? Well, the reality is, is usually not right in front, right? You know, most cities have policies where if there's people in desperate need, they, they kind of shove them over there where they're not seen. Where do you have to look for those people? Maybe even in our community, some of the people that are hurting the most, probably not very visible. But look at what Onesiphorus did. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently. You can almost feel the sense and the meaning of these words 
as Paul just gives thanks to God for what Onesiphorus did. Was it easy for Onesiphorus to find Paul? No, it wasn't. This guy had to probably maybe even spend months asking around for Paul. Remember, Paul is about to be executed. Onesiphorus could have realized, you know what, Paul's about to die. If, what if I go through all this trouble trying to find him and then I find he's already dead? You know, he could have told himself that and said, you know what, maybe it's not worth the trouble. But he didn't. What did Onesiphorus do? He continued diligently to find where Paul was at and be able to come and minister to his needs. This is the mark of a man or a woman of God. They don't care what the results are. They're going to get in there and keep trying to help and find a way to help, even if it's difficult, embarrassing, troubling, whatever it is, to find and minister to the needs of those that are hurting most. That is courage. Boy, have I seen that in this church. Well, I've, I've seen some of you just, that you just pursue like a bulldog after someone coming, trying to find them, trying to minister to their needs, trying to give them something that would help them through the difficult time. Be like Onesiphorus. The fifth one here this morning. His salvation is assured through Jesus Christ. Let's see the, the second one. The Lord grants unto him that he may find mercy in the Lord that day. Now, could Paul save Onesiphorus from his sin? No, he can't. Jesus Christ did that. But Paul knows this is a man of God. The way he behaves, he's a man of God. And I can declare this statement with confidence, knowing that God has already given him mercy, and that ultimately he will receive mercy in the day of judgment. Because he has put his faith in Jesus Christ, and he lives his life by faith, which produces love. Indestructible love. Undaunted love. Courageous love. Love. You see that? There's not very many phrases here, but you can feel the sense of the words as Paul describes what Onesiphorus did. And he says, God, I know that this man will receive mercy and the day of judgment. His testimony speaks for himself. He's assured of his salvation in Christ, and he lives like it. How do I know that you don't believe that you're a Christian? Because you don't act like it. Until you believe that you're a Christian and you believe in the atoning work of Christ, and the complete atonement work of Christ, you will never behave like a Christian. You will never live your life of love the way God commanded you to do. You will never be like Onesiphorus. You have to start, first start, with a faith and assurance in Jesus Christ for your salvation. The final sixth thing this morning is the faithfulness of his ministry speaks for itself. Look at this last phrase here. In how many things he ministered unto me in Ephesus. That's where... Paul was working as a pastor in the city of Ephesus. Thou knowest very well. What was Paul saying? He says, his reputation precedes him. This is a man of God. Everybody knows who he is because whenever you see him or her, whoever it is, they're ministering to other people's needs. They're seeking out diligently to find those people. They're preaching the love and mercy of Christ. They're seeking diligently for those that are in need. They're not ashamed of those who are suffering. And whether it's for Christ or for any suffering at all. Thou knowest very well. What an absolute statement. Paul doesn't have to question this. Paul doesn't have to say, well, sometimes he's a good guy. Sometimes he does what's right. No, he's consistently, over the long haul, over a period of many years, has demonstrated his absolute faith, his religious diligence. You know, when someone said, an old preacher once said, you know, you can have all the degrees, you can have all the awesome, cool things that a pastor can have to try to be a good pastor, you can do all the things that would, would seem awesome, but the most important thing as a pastor that you could possibly do is be faithful. Whether any service is that true in the church, whether you're a deacon or whether you're just somebody who's serving in church, be faithful. Be faithful. Now, you might do a good deed for God, and it will never be seen. But what God says is, hey, don't look at the sermon on that. What does he say? He says, hey, you should be doing that as unto the Lord anyways. Who cares if nobody sees it? You just keep on doing it. But I guarantee, if you have that kind of attitude, people are going to find out that you have that kind of attitude. And they're going to recognize that it's the work of Christ in your life, and that you've changed us. Be consistent. In a world of inconsistency, in a world of lack of, they say the average preacher uh, preaches for about five years and then moves on to the next church. Be consistent. Be faithful to the best of your abilities. 
Stick with the tough tasks. Don't give up. Be like this. Be reliant on God's mercy. Be ministers to the physical needs of others. Do not be ashamed of the physical suffering of, the, of other believers that speak out on their behalf. Diligently seek for those in need in order to help them. Be assured of your salvation through Jesus Christ and be faithful in the ministry that God has called you to. Let's bow for prayer. Every head bow, every eye closed. Two simple points this morning. I know I went on and on, but the point is simple. Cling to the Word of God. The, logo, the, the capital W Word of God, the Logos, Jesus Christ. And the little W word of God, the Bible. Cling to the truth of it. Rest your life in it. Mull over the truth and the treasure of it. Surround yourself this morning. Could you please make a commitment this morning? I've seen too many people come, get excited. They want to be a part of the church. They want to do all these things, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Do not be a number to those people. They're the ones missing out. We feel sad for those people. I hope that someday the Lord will restore them to fellowship with us. We need to pray and maybe go look for those people. But do not be numbered this morning among those people. Commit in your heart that you will first cling to God's Word. You will cling to the Logos. And this morning that you will purpose to surround yourself with godly people. I know some of you have done this. You've done this over your, the course of your life. Some of you this morning... And over the past couple of years, you've chosen to do this. And I have seen the testimony and the witness that that has made, not just to me, but to the community. There's still some of you who need to purpose this morning. You're still on the fence. You're still kind of, well, I'll be there sometimes. I'll cling to the Word of God sometimes. It doesn't work that way. Don't be like biologists and homogenies. Choose this morning. I want to be a part of the number of the people of God. I'm not going to let anger, I'm not going to let bitterness, I'm not going to let uh, whatever it is that's holding you back from fellowship with the believers here in this church. Choose not to let that hold you back. Give it to God. Just say, God, this morning, I'm done with that. I'm sick and tired of carrying that around. Lord, you work in that person's heart, you work in my heart to change it. Help me to come in faith and be able to worship you. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you this morning. If there is a soul this morning that is making this commitment in their heart. I pray to God that you would enable them to do that. That we would soon see the fruits of such a commitment in their life. That we would be able to be witnesses and say, you know what? That's an onus of us. They look for others and they minister to others' physical needs, but most importantly, they are faithful in the work of Jesus Christ and their, their reputation precedes them. Lord, I pray to God that this morning, as, as people are choosing to make this commitment, that we would later see, in the years to come, the blessings of the fruit of that. Pray these things in faith in Jesus Christ, upon the love of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to get a chance to praise God together. That's what church is about.